Hello everybody and welcome to the online premiere of The Limit. My name is Ailsa McClellan and I'm the coordinator of the Our Seas Coalition, which is a group of over 90 organisations campaigning together for urgent change in the way Scotland's seas are managed. I'm told that we've got around 200 people joined online from all around Scotland and the UK and I know there are a few folk abroad, so that's really brilliant, even though I know that most of you are stuck and that you're probably fed up with Netflix by now. We hope that you enjoy the film and that it encourages conversation and that you can stay with us for the Q&A at the end. But before we start, I'd just like to say a wee bit about how the coalition started and to introduce our special guest, Professor Ian Stewart. Over 80% of Scotland is underwater. We truly are a coastal nation. Our seeds are a huge and precious asset, but unfortunately our coastal waters are in terrible shape. Our seabed habitats are varied and there's varied as terrestrial habitats and they should be carpeting the seabed in the same way as forests, fields, mud and bogs for, cover the rest of Scotland. These habitats support fisheries but they are also significant carbon sinks. We need them but they have been lost at an alarming rate within our own generation and most of us can't see that happening. Many of us can remember a time when our seas were a lot more productive than they are now. The divers in this coalition have borne witness to this terrible decline in habitats and other marine stakeholders are feeling the effects of this decline. That's why this coalition formed two years ago. We're lucky enough to have a hugely diverse membership and that includes gigantic charities such as the National Trust for Scotland, the Blue Marine Foundation, Oceana and Flora and Fauna International. But we've also got a lot of the little businesses and charities that make up coastal communities, such as boat builders, creelers and divers, shellfish farmers, sea angling clubs, community trusts and environmental charities. This cause unites every one of us. Along with so many sectors, the fishing industry is taking a terrible beating with Brexit and COVID. The current situation highlights exactly why we need to instill um, resilience into our inshore waters and the communities that rely on them and resilience comes from diversity. The Scottish Government released their marine assessment just before Christmas in December last year and it showed that we have had a decade of terrible habitat decline inshore despite the implementation of marine protected areas 10 years ago. The, re the regeneration of habitats must be an urgent priority woven into fisheries management and not an afterthought or something to be considered separately. We debated long and hard about what we were going to call this coalition and in the end we felt that our seas fit. In property terms, the sea doesn't belong to any one of us. They're a public asset, they're a common heritage and they must be managed with future generations in mind. For his BBC series, Making Scotland's Landscapes, Professor Ian Stewart gave a really clear picture of how our fisheries have gotten into the, the state that they're in today but also a bit of hope in showing that what could be done to make them better. We are so delighted that you've agreed to open this screening for us tonight, Professor Ian. Um, so thank you very much and over to you. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Elsa. And thanks uh, to everyone for, for joining us. That's that's great. Um, out of sight, out of mind. The sea has always been a place of mystery, but also human indifference. That was the, that was the opening line to... Um, the, a series that I, the episode on the sea from the series that I made ten years ago, making Scotland's landscape. So it's wonderful to be asked back here by by Open Sea, uh, Open Seas to uh, our seas rather to um, to be provoked really into thinking about what's happened in the intervening decade. You know, catch up. Um, making Scotland's landscape was a series that was built on a, a fundamental paradox, and that was. That, that Scotland is seen as this natural wilderness wonderland, you know, it's pristine, it's untouched, it's, it's, it's that, those highlands and lowlands and the, the islands, everything completely beautifully pristine and natural. And yet, kind of by and large, that is, it's, that's, a romantic, that's a romantic fiction that we sell to ourselves as much as to anyone else. We occupy a completely human landscape that's been managed well to the limits really and I think for me uh, although I knew that from the academic kind of literature it was still a, a massive surprise I mean I left Scotland in 1986 and living for my sins down in, in England 
for most of the time. So to, to go back and, and film in Scotland was was brilliant at one level. You know, I was blown away and, and completely charmed by just the extraordinary beauty of Scotland, um, of course. But then, you know, as you de- if you delved into the detail, you you became despondent, sometimes completely scunnered by realizing just how degraded our natural habitats were. And how, and probably more depressingly, really, was how disconnected people seemed to be from that, from that critical world. And it was definitely the sea episode more than in any other that really influenced me because the the premise of um, making Scotland's landscape was really um, influenced by the naturalist um, and, and conservationist Frank Fraser Darling, and and he talked a lot mainly about the land. You know, he talked about the Highlands and and that. And that's where you could see the disconnect. You know, he talks about Highlands being impoverished, uh, food chains full of missing links, you know, a, a wet desert. It, you know, that's amazingly evocative, that. A sterile landscape systematically asset stripped. So you can see it on the land. Um, but that was the thing about those opening lines out of sight, out of mind, a place of mystery, but also of human indifference, because it was a realisation that that, that sterilization essentially extended into those coastal and marine waters. And that was what was thoroughly depressing. And, but the episode ended up with, with me and, and Howard and the team at Lamlash Bay. You know, that was, our, that was our grand climax. That was our future looking into the, the challenge ahead. And it was, it, was, it was pretty optimistic. You know, I think my, I've got my final words. My final words were, uh, you know, there's still things to be done. But I can't feel help but feel optimistic that we can restore life and habitats to the sea because it's in everyone's interest to do so. Well, um, what's the reality? Ten years on, is it better? Is it worse? What's the update on trawling and, and dredging and illegal fishing? What about the much we, we talked about the National Marine Plan in the program? What about that? You know, and and here's the irony. Um, Making Scotland's Landscape was back on the screens again at the start of the year. And I got loads of emails because a lot of people thought it was new. And that in itself is quite depressing, that, that a programme that's made 10 years ago comes back on and everyone thinks it's just as fresh, that the arguments are just as relevant and relatable as they were 10 years ago. And it's, so that gives a bit of an inkling that maybe not all is right. And yet, you know, in the meantime, we've got the Marine Act, we've got more marine preserved areas, uh, protected areas. So what's the real story? What is the state of play with Scotland Seas? Well, uh, this film is the one that's going to show you. So enjoy. Thank you very much for that, Professor Ian. Um, now it's time to watch the film and there's going to be a live Q&A afterwards. So please send any questions you've got via direct message to our Twitter or Facebook accounts or email them to info at ourseas.scot. You might notice that I'm in the film, um, which was perhaps the coldest I've ever been on a beach in my life. I just wanted to make it clear that it was filmed many, many months before I took on this coordinator's role. And I'm in the film as somebody with a background in marine science who has made her living from the sea since she graduated and who would like to continue to do so. Neither the film nor this screening would be possible without a, such a huge amount of hard work from so many members of the coalition. And I just want to thank them all very much for making my job easier. Now, I hope you enjoy the film and that you can all stick around for the Q&A afterwards. Thank you very much. was once a hugely thriving ecosystem. We couldn't have cleaned it out anymore had we tried. It would be mad to assume that towing a heavy metal dredge over any of these habitats wasn't going to have a degrading effect on it. It's kind of heartbreaking to think that my boys might live to see a time when the, the seas are barren or close to it. The smallest of the trawlers have been squeezed the hardest and have probably got the, the worst of, it, of all the fishermen. I think the problem doesn't so much lie with trawlers or dredgers, it lies with fisheries management. Imagine a limit around the whole of the coastline. It would just be a massive step forward. My dad is 
a fisherman and fishermen, no matter how they fish or where they fish, they're all going to be judged by history in the same light. It's just a breathtaking world, really. You step into the icy water, you submerge, and it's just a totally new world that opens up around you. There's kelp forests tangled in knots that ebb and flow with the tide. There's octopuses crawling around on the seabed. Do you know what? It's really scary how quickly these underwater worlds are being destroyed, along with the fish that depend on them. And most of the time, no one even knows that it's happening. I've been diving Loch Caron for 15, 16 years and so I know the area, I know what sort of animals are here and I know how beautiful flame shells in particular are. It's 2017, a marine biologist who's local to the area and she had seen a scallop dredger dredging in, in right in um, this side of Plockton, quite close to um, where we are sitting just now, over an, an area where there's known to be a flame shell reef. He's got these gorgeous iron brew coloured tentacles. They're very fragile systems and yet really, really important. So myself and a few colleagues, we managed to get together a few days later. When we first dived down, um, we were expecting to see, uh, a, well, hoping to see a healthy flame shell reef. Having dived it many times before, you know full well how many species rely on it and depend on it and live in it, live on it, feed in it. It was quite, quite distressing. It was utterly dis destroyed broken and dead crabs, starfish with multiple arms missing. But it's the flame shells in particular. To see flame shell reefs lying in their tens of thousands, dead, dying on the bottom, crushed, the shells are broken, the flesh is all hanging out. We came up pretty, pretty quiet, but also in a weird way relieved that we'd found it and that we, could, we had the footage that we thought might be there and, and put, it, put it out there and hopefully encourage the government to, to do something about it. It's one of the things that makes fishermen being nice, the weather, the seasons, and definitely sunrises like that kind of make it worth it. Oh, geez, oh, here we go. All my family was out there fishing. My uh, dad's two brothers and my dad were fishing, and on my mum's side, her brothers were all fishing. I worked on scallop dredgers, prawn trawlers, Keel fishing is my preference. I wouldn't really do any of the other types of fishing now. I find it a lot more uh, palatable to do. When I was younger, I was working on trawlers. I'm pretty sure I got fired off one of the trawlers I was working on because I was running around trying to save all the fish. And um, you see a lot of conger eels and skate and stuff like that. Fish that'll survive, even being in the trawl, but you have to get it off the deck quite quickly. And uh, you're meant to be there shoveling prawns and tailing prawns. I mean, I can understand for, for the skipper of these boats, seeing an idiot like me running around trying to save fish um, while he's trying to pay his mortgage and get a wage in for the boys, bad weather coming, all the rest of it. But, um, yeah, it wasn't the job for me. Fishing's still poor, weather's not great. We've got a nice sunrise though. Small consolation, but you've got to look on the bright side. Life's too short to whinge the whole way through it. So you get, you get buried prawns and non-buried prawns. You can see these, these, are, these, are, these are eggs on the prawns. So we tend to try and throw these ones back. There's no law about it, but these are all potential prawns. And that aspect, keel fishing, is definitely far more sustainable than trawling. The, the net has a set of trawl doors, heavy metal doors, which pull the, the sides of the net apart. And often the trawl doors are skimming the seabed. And if you get places where the trawlers are going round and round and round, like as happens in here, 
controlling is very similar to harrowing a field, I would argue. The first pass of the harrows, you just notice the grass flattened a little. The second pass of the harrows, they've maybe pulled out some moss and so on and so forth. But as the farmer goes round and round with the harrows, eventually he turns the field to a, a tilth with nothing living on the surface. There may be places where it's more appropriate to plough the seabed than others. But at the moment, the management says you can plough anything you can get your plough on. <laughs> as a public, we have to ask, do we want all of our seabed to be ploughed? ecosystem is things like merle, so merle, merle is a type of corally seaweed, then the merle grows at something like a millimeter a year. So once the merle gets ground into something that looks like coarse sand, then it could be hundreds of years, many hundreds of years before that ecosystem can recover. So it turns out that these merle beds is the nursery ground for, for so many species. We shouldn't be dredging for scallops on merrow beds because we're actually undermining the scallop fishery by removing the scallop nursery grounds. And the same is true with prawn trawling. That then there's nowhere for the fish, for the juvenile fish to live. We see almost no fish around here now. A few juvenile cod maybe. That's about it. Whereas if you look at the charts, the, the paper charts, the maps of the seabed in this area that were made 50 and 80 years ago, they've got places on them named after the fish that used to be found there. So there's places on the chart called the Haddy Bank, but yet there's no Haddy here. So this is a cod, it's about as big a cod as we see, and he'll go back alive. If there was less trawling and more keel fishing in here, then we would see things like cod recovery. I mean, we'd like to see recovery of, of all of the species that once lived in here. Whether or not that's possible, I don't know. This is where I started most of my working life. Um, this is Kyle of Kalish Pier. It's a very industrial place. It's always been an industrial place. When I was started fishing, there was quite a fleet in here, especially when it opened to trawling each year. So this whole edge of the pier would be chocker with, with boats of all shapes and sizes. It's quite a different place now than it was. It was once a lot more hustle bustle, nets getting stretched out and mended, forklifts zooming around. At break time, there would be a stream of blue boiler suits streaming out the door of the factory, all heading up to the shops. And now, now you're hard pushed to spot a fisherman. Over here behind me is, is the old Kyle Seafoods. It was my dad's prawn processing factory. Most of the local boats would be landing into there. So this is the old yard where the forklifts would have worked. And then the prawns would make their way into the, the actual factory itself and around all the tables would be prawn packers, mostly girls, but there was a few boys doing the job too. The sheer volume of prawns that would come through here, even in a week, and 50 odd people running around in forklifts and very smelly overalls. Um, it was a lot of smelly people working here. <laughs> it could be quite impressive in the summer. And then they dumped these huge walk-in freezers here. 
And you could have two or three guys working in here at minus 17. Literally, somebody's in their t-shirts just throwing boxes of prawns around. They'd be working that hard. My dad had a fish packing facility and then when the fish became more scarce they moved on to packing shellfish and then eventually it was just prawn and eventually there wasn't enough prawn coming in and the market was too volatile and the place folded. As we've worked our way down the food chain um, things have had to change and yeah I would say this is another victim of that change. It's a bit sad to see this place like this. I mean there's a, there's a lot of jobs that are no longer here and that means that the community itself has declined because there would have been millions of pounds coming through here, getting spent in the local shops, renting houses, and the decline affects everybody on the West Coast. It's interesting because I've read some of the arguments for and against that were argued in the 1880s when they talked about bringing the three mile limit in in the first place. And uh, even those who were against the three mile limit at the time, who were all for sort of unbridled capitalism and, and the survival of the fittest, that kind of stuff, even those guys, I think they would weep if they'd seen what had happened now. They convinced each other in the 1880s that there was so much damage being caused by trawling and so much degradation of the environment, decline of fish stocks and gear conflict that they should ban trawling. And that was in the days when trawling was done with sailing boats. I mean, there was once a hugely thriving ecosystem and it was so bountiful that you could harvest vast quantities every year and not make a dent in it. But unfortunately, the harvests got more and more vast until we started making a dent in it. And then when we started making a dent in it, we didn't stop. We couldn't have cleaned it out anymore had we tried. I'm kind of born and bred West Coaster, I love the sea, I always have. I was brought up beside the sea and spent a lot of time on boats my whole life. It's heartbreaking for me to think that we can accept the degradation in our inshore habitat when clearly we don't need to and there are better ways of managing it for everybody. My name is Ailsa McClellan, um, I've got a background in marine science and I've worked in inshore fisheries management for about 18 years. Currently, we've got an oyster farm and are looking to diversify into seaweed. People have eaten it on the coast of Ireland and Scotland all through time. It grows abundantly and really quickly in our coastal waters. The kelp habitat is one of the most biodiverse habitats on the planet. It's comparable with a rainforest. Invertebrates, eh, which in turn feed fin fish, shellfish, birds, mammals like seals and otters, and of course us humans as well. All of these areas just support so much life. We've still got healthy kelp up in Scotland and we need to be protecting that. It would be mad to assume that towing a heavy metal dredge over any of these habitats wasn't going to have a degrading effect on it. And we have lost the fin fish fishery largely in the inshore, to, to a massive extent. We fished these seas for thousands of years, but it's only in the last few decades that we've pushed the fisheries to the absolute limit. We really need to separate out the two types of fishery to manage them properly. If we had a three mile limit back, we could still have vibrant fisheries and therefore vibrant coastal communities within the three miles. We could have creeling, diving, rod and line fisheries. It is really important that things are done in a fair way so that employment opportunities aren't lost. But with proper fisheries management, we should have more vibrant fisheries, not less. We've all got a stake in the sea. It belongs to all of us. And it's up to all of us to put pressure on governments to get some limits back in place so that we can protect the fisheries that are left and get recovery of some of the stocks that we have lost in the past few decades. I spend a lot of time down the beach with Max and Cami. Uh, we, we, we go down as often as we can really. Um, after school quite often we'll head down to some of the little beaches nearby. Max already talking about diving, he speaks about daddy being a diver when he's at school and I'm definitely interested in helping him learn when he's older. 
got some other bits and bobs to show you here. So did you see this guy properly? He's a beautiful colour, isn't he? This one's called a, an edible urchin. It does look like an eyeball, doesn't it? Yeah. That's actually his mouth in there. Isn't that cool? I like those starfish. You like the starfish, yeah. Well, these ones are one of my favourites. I'll just get him out of the water for a minute. He'll be okay for a second. If I get him in the light, look how beautiful he is. Yeah, stroke him. You can give him a tickle. Nice and gentle like that. Well done. Do you want to hold one? Put your hand out flat. Pop him on your hands. Whoa. There you go. I used my little lobes of soaking on to me. On each of these arms, he's got loads and loads of little suckers. And he, that's how he sticks down in the, on the seabed when he's out in the sea. Do you think we should put him back in the water? Yeah. Let's put him back down here. If humans as a species continue to damage the environment like we're doing just now, then we will see you know, a, a big change in the number of animals, the number of species, the, the habitats that are available to these animals. I want my boys to be able to dive uh, when they're older and see the same things that I'm seeing. And it's, it's kind of heartbreaking to think that my boys might live to see a time when the, the seas are barren or close to it. So well, we're hoping to move into this thing. My last uh, temporary accommodation was more temporary than I'd hoped. I've been living on the croft here for well, quite a few years now. Unfortunately, the original caravan I got is uh, barely habitable. So this place is going to have to do this now for the next wee while until we get the house built. If my grandfather and father had been builders, they'd probably know what I was doing. But no, they condemned me to life at sea instead. There's a little pipe cutter, I think it's at the door. Can you get it for me? You know the wee thing, I mean the wee black. Okay, halfway there boys, I think there'll be cheese and toast yet. If you, if you compare what's going on in land reform with what's going on in fisheries, basically they want rid of the people in order to put sheep on the land. And the, the same thing really happened in inshore fishing, in that after industrial fisheries were invented, the smaller scale fisheries, who were often just fishing for their own livelihoods, they were seen to be um, some kind of throwback to the past. And because trawlers and, and, and larger fishing vessels could catch more using less men, they were seen to be more efficient and therefore they should really have more right, they were more profitable. But what we're really seeing now is that the, the real profit that we should be getting from fisheries is employment and return to local communities. And these large industrial fishing vessels and fishing interests do the opposite of that. They often take away and deprive communities of their incomes and their ability to work their own resource base. years worth of crap. Well, Mind your French. Oh. Jump around there and pull that off please. Yeah. This is where the gas goes on and I don't have any kind of an adapter. Nothing in there. A uh, cheese sandwiches for lunch today I think. Just as well I didn't get soup. In the fishing industry, almost every male that preceded me in my family on both my mother and father's side was at the fishing. Certainly we're going back at least three generations in, in this community. I did much, much the same as, as my son now in the sense that I, I fished in the holidays, I washed creels. You know, he's got this background of fishing in his heritage, but to some degree I, I hope he doesn't go fishing. And I hope if he does go fishing, then we've done something with the fishing industry to make it better than it is now. Otherwise he's inheriting a, a, a dying industry and that's a, a hellish thing to condemn someone to, I think. I'm going to end up working a fishing boat at one point or another, maybe not forever, maybe not for a smiley, but at some point I'm probably going to. My dad is 
a fisherman and fishermen, no matter how they fish or where they fish, they're all going to be judged by history in the same light. And I know it's sad and I know it's probably not fair. I hope that history looks back and says, well, they did, they did all right, they tried their best and they did it sustainably. It's almost safe enough to eat something. Yeah, shouldn't you? And it's a stereotype that Highlanders are less civilised. I hope you like chunky cheese, that's all I can say. No, having this beef and chair makes me feel like it back at sea again. <laughs> <laughs> It's not it's back and forth. Nothing to do with your amazing <laughs> way. Try <laughs> your skills, does it? No. So this is the village of Plockton on the west coast. It's on the shores of Loch Carran. The, the old village and the main village that was created back in the day is, is a long street of houses on the edge of the water of a very sheltered bay. Unusually for these very small highland villages, there's a, a railway. Back in the day, the original idea was that they would be exporting large quantities of fish out of here. At the time, they were moving people from inland down towards the coast, trying to promote the fishing industry, especially the herring industry that was taking off at the time. And so they built harbours and villages up and down the west coast of Scotland. Portree, Plockton, Ullapool. There was a lot of towns in the highlands that were built to accommodate the, the population moving from inland, getting dispossessed of their crofts and their agricultural holdings. It doesn't have much of a fishing industry here now. So everybody had to move their gear or yes. not fish where they would have liked to or otherwise been able to fish for fear of losing their gear. Yeah, pumping the gear is far up the shore, you know, up onto the heart, out the way as you can. We're too scared to put them out there because we lose them. Yeah. I'm just going to update you on what the crack is with the NSM pilot at the moment. If it goes ahead, we've got until April next year to form a local management committee, which has to have trawlers on it, NGOs on it, environmental groups on it, Marine Scotland on it, and a representative from each community. And then that management group makes the rules for the pilot area. In order to comply with our end of the bargain, we have to agree to nobody working more than 1,600 creels. And an increase in minimum landing size. Yeah, yeah, of course, yes, yeah. yeah. So, is there anyone else got any other issues they'd like to raise while we're here, or any questions? Or... Don't mention Brexit. <laughs> 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 You're at the wrong meeting, mate. <laughs> I was trawling for about 10 years. From what would it be, about 1985 until 1996. Well, and I, I, bought the, I bought the trawler because, well, they, they decided to do away with the three mile limit. So I thought it would be a better opportunity to make more money, but, um, which I did, of course. So, but I, I just started reading more about the actual environmental damage that the trawl was doing, speaking to some of my friends who were diving, and they were telling me what damage was being done to the seabed and to creatures on the seabed. And I, I can see where, when, you, when you hold the trawl right up, You've got a huge bycatch catch of small fish, you know, little crabs, sea urchins, ontonins. So I did tell I did tell quails, as I say, not deliberately, but there was an attitude amongst the prawn, the, the mobile fleet that any creels in those trawl areas were considered to be fair game. Fisheries management is the cause of much of the gear conflict that we see. I think the trawlers have been pressurised probably more than anybody else. The, the big boats that come around here from the east coast, they push the smaller trawlers inshore, which push the smaller trawlers again inshore. And then when the really smallest trawlers get inshore, they have to meet the creel guys. And, uh, and we're all fighting over the same space. So I think, I think the smallest of the trawlers have been squeezed the hardest and have probably got the, the worst of, it, of all the fishermen. For most of these guys, they literally don't have a choice. They're, they try to pay their mortgages. If they don't pay their mortgages, they they don't have a house or a job, so um, yeah, most of them are just doing what they can. Most of them are, are not breaking the law. Even if, even if we find their method of fishing abhorrent for whatever reason, they're still doing what fisheries management says is the way they should be fishing. I think the problem doesn't so much lie with trawlers or dredgers, it lies with fisheries management. <laughs> right, come over here a minute, boys. So we have a look under this rock. We do. Just gently 
you're lifting up. Max, what's this? A crab. It's a teeny tiny little crab. He is tiny. This is his house. This is where he lives. Have you given him a name yet? Pinchy, I like Pinchy. Pincher. Pincher, the Pinchy Crab. In 2017. The strange thing about this whole circumstance is that the dredger, uh, he was perfectly legal, he was perfectly able to come into Loch Caron, perfectly legally put down his dredges and dredge the area, despite there being a flame shell reef there. You know, we weren't annoyed at him, he was just doing what dredgers do, which is trying to find scallops. And that's the, the most frustrating thing about this, I suppose, is that it took someone to come in and, and damage that area for us to then manage to get it protected. MPAs are a fantastic idea in principle, um, but let's be honest, even the ones we've got aren't being properly policed. You know, folk are still able to come in and, and illegally dredge, for instance, and unless the government are able to, to put something more, you know, more enforcement in place to actually look after the areas we've got and, and further protect these areas, then, then kind of like, what's the point? They're just a tiny proportion of the, the coastline, you know, they're half a loch here, they're a section of a loch there. Yeah, it's far too little, just far too little. Imagine a, a limit around the whole of the coastline, you know, Scotland's got a huge coastline. It's bigger than the coastline of the rest of the UK put together. Um, and if that whole area was, was protected, it would just be a massive step forward. doubt about it that fisheries management has been a colossal cock up, um, a wasted opportunity and uh, I often think if we, you know, if we had a blank slate, how would we do it? It certainly wouldn't be like it's done now. The problem is we don't have a blank slate and now we've got hundreds of men whose jobs and mortgages rely on things not changing too dramatically too suddenly and that's my biggest concern i think we have to start with the premise that the resource which is closest to a community to some degree belongs to that community more than say it belongs to somebody from a faraway place that doesn't live there and there's an incentive to manage a fishery properly if it's exploited by by local people let's just say we manage to successfully recover the fish who gets to fish them? Because it's not necessarily the people that take the fall now and, and, and take the losses now that, that will get to fish them. The right to fish is based on ownership of quota. And because there's no fish here, nobody owns the quota. So we could go to great lengths, put, put some fishermen out of work, tie up the trawlers, pay a great pain, only for someone else to come round from the east coast in a big pelagic boat and clean the place out in a day. We need quite a lot of things to change, not just the trawling. The whole of inshore fisheries management needs to change. That's, that's the crux of it. It's not the trawlermen's fault, it's not the fishermen's fault, it's the fisheries management fault. They've designed a system whereby trawlers and keelmen have to compete for the same thing. They've designed a system whereby only those who have got quota can catch the fish. There's so much absurdity in the way they've designed fisheries management that personally I find it quite frustrating that, that the instinct the public have just to blame the fishermen for the state of fishing because most fishermen don't have any role in fisheries management they don't they don't get to decide what to catch and how to catch it and what's legal and what's not legal that's all done at the government level and really that's that's where future fisheries management has to come from not the fishermen but the government
Hi, my name is Maya and I'm from the Elfful Sea Savers. We joined the RC's coalition because we know how important it is to make a healthy, sustainable sea for everyone's future. Hi there, my name's Chris and I live in Aberdeenshire. I'm a member of the Our Seas Coalition through Project Media, a not-for-profit conservation film company. As a scuba diver, I've seen firsthand the damage that the most damaging forms of fisheries can do to our sheltered, shallow, fragile inshore waters. I believe the Scottish Government does not do enough currently to protect these waters. Very few areas have any protection, and those areas that do have protection, that protection is not enforced properly. I believe it's incumbent upon the Scottish Government to increase protection and change the way we look at our inshore fisheries management altogether. Good afternoon, my name's Andrew Binney. I'm the director with the Community of Iron Seabed Trust, commonly known as COAST. Uh, I was a director previously up until 2017 and I've returned for a second time. Um, I'm delighted to see that the Our Seas Coalition has been such a success and has so many groups now involved with it. I think it's really important that communities around Scotland and organisations and individuals really show to the Scottish Government there's such a strong sense of uh, feeling about changing the way we uh, manage our inshore waters. These have been so badly managed for such a long time that communities are really suffering. They're actually suffering without even realising they are suffering because they're so used to not having health productive seas. If we can change the way our inshore waters are managed by convincing the Scottish Government to show real political will to change the way they, they, they do this and it is their ultimate responsibility, then we can ensure that our communities in the future have a real uh, sustainable livelihood and that they continue to thrive far into the future. I'm part of Coolis, the community association of locks and sounds. Coolis joined the Our Seas Coalition because we wanted the voices of our coastal community to be heard. The Our Seas Coalition represents many coastal communities from around Scotland, all of who want to see seabed management reform that benefits us now and into the future. Hi everyone, my name is Joe and I work for the marine conservation charity Blue Marine Foundation and I'm based in Scotland on the south east coast in Berwickshire. Um, so we joined the Our Seas Coalition because we really believe urgent change is required to recover Scotland's incredible uh, inshore waters. And what we like about the Our Seas Solution is it's one that benefits everyone, not just marine life, but the fisheries and the local communities. Hi, I'm David Nairn. I work for Clyde Park Boys Community Interest Company. I also help out with the Fairly Coastal Trust. And why do we support the Our Seas Coalition? Basically, it's because we're sick of watching dredgers rip up the bay and witnessing all the damage it causes to the seabed and the marine environment. It's a changed environment. The Clyde's totally dominated by scavenger species. We know there's got to be another way. The health and the wealth, if you like, of the people and the environment totally depend on it. Look at the shambles we're in because of COVID and Brexit. They're, you know, they're, it's, they're, now is the time for meaningful inshore fisheries reform, a process that enables fishermen to transition towards more sustainable fisheries methods, a system that allocates opportunity to local inshore vessels that have a low environmental impact. It's simple. If we do this, we can help the environment and we can help fishermen. I'm Dr Lauren Smith, the founder of Saltwater Life, a marine research and conservation organisation. We are members of the Our Seas Coalition, an important alliance seeking further protection and sustainable use of our coastal seas. I'm Willie Kennedy. I'm a keen Scottish sea angler. I'm involved with the Scottish Sea Anglers Conservation Network and also the Scottish Federation of Sea Anglers. As sea anglers, we would love to see better management of the inshore waters, in particular the stopping of the bottom dredge trawl, trawling that's allowed to continue. We would love to see the reinstatement of the three mile limit that was taken uh, away in the 1980s. We see them being a member of the coalition as a fantastic opportunity for not just sea anglers, but all uh, marine uh, orientated organisations, local communities, etc. 
to join together as one voice to fight for better management. And I would urge any other organisations or individuals to join up and support the coalition's fantastic work. My name is Danny Renton. I work for a charity called Sea Wilding, and uh, we do marine habitat restoration projects in Argyle. We're a member of the RC's coalition and we support the restoration of the inshore limit. And the reason is, if you talk to divers who've been diving up and down the West Coast for the last 30 or 40 years, they will tell you it used to look like the Red Sea, maybe not quite as colourful, but in terms of biodiversity. But now, much of it looks like a gravel park. And the reason is, scallop dredges and bottom trawlers have been allowed to operate right up at the top of the sea locks and they've blitzed the fish spawning grounds and the fish nurseries. And the result is the loss of biodiversity. You see it in the collapse in commercial fish stocks and you see it in the collapse in seabird numbers. So we have to bring back the inshore limit to reverse this damage so we can restore the health of the seas and to give something for future generations. Hello, welcome back everybody and I hope that you enjoyed that film and it has given you some food for thought. So now it's the questions and answers. We've been getting a few in via social media and through our email address. There isn't an open Zoom room, but if you have any questions, please send them via direct message on our Twitter or Facebook or email info at ourseas.scot. If you've got to leave now, please remember that we are actively campaigning for change. And as you can see from the end credits of the film, we are urging specific action. We have a website and are active on social media, so please join us. You will see the link to the petition at the description at the bottom of the page. So now I would like to introduce the panel from within the coalition who are going to be answering your questions. We have Bally Philp, who is a creel fisherman based near Kyle of Loch Alsh. He is a member of the Northwest Responsible Fishermen's Association and the Scottish Creel Fishermen's Federation. We've got Ali Hewson, who is from the North East and is the MD of Celtic Sea Fair, Chair of the SCFF and the Scottish Scallop Divers Association. We've got Shona Marshall, who is the Head Biologist of West Sutherland Fisheries Trust and she's based up in Scourie. We have Nick Underdown, who is on the Executive Staff of the Sustainable Fishing Charity Open Seas and he's over in Och. We have Joe Berwick, sorry, sorry, Joe. We have Joe Richards from Berwickshire, who is the project manager for Blue Marine Foundation. Jenny Stark, who is the outreach and communication manager for Aran Coast. We've got Danny Renton down in Middergyle, who is the founder of Sea Wilding, which is a community-led native oyster restoration project in Loch Craignish, which may be the largest in Scotland, maybe not, that is allegedly. Um, we've got Cal Major, who is the founder of Paddle Against Plastic, which is a charity raising awareness of plastic pollution, and she spends much of her time afloat around Scotland's coasts. Last, but by no means least, we have Pobby and Megan from the Ullipool Sea Savers, who have done such an incredible job of raising awareness of very many um, marine issues. And on a practical level, they have picked up tons of litter from our beaches in Westeros and the Leibys. So well done to you guys for taking practical action and you are the hope of the future. So now let's just start the questions. I'm going to ask them of the panel and then they will hopefully wave their hand at me and I will be able to direct you to them. So the first one up there is how much support within the fishing industry is there for this? Ali? It depends exactly what you mean by this. Um, if you mean spatial management, we know from the 2014 Creel Effort Study, about 85% of fishermen interviewed on the west coast of Scotland supported spatial management. If you look at the Inshore Fishery Group's management plans, almost every single management plan has spatial management as a top priority. But if you specify what the, the this is and say is it a one mile limit, then you probably find that nobody would agree or a three mile limit, nobody would agree. So most fishermen agree there should be spatial management. Trying to get them to agree on what that spatial management should look like has got to be the next trick. 
Thanks very much for that. Anyone else got anything to add? Nope. Um, so next is, how much will this cost and where will the money come from? Anybody? Bally? Okay, I'm getting all the tricky ones tonight. Um, so, again, um, where the money will come from is maybe easier than how much it will cost, but we think there's quite big budgets for, for marine reform. There's a hundred million pound being allocated by the UK government, of which the Scottish government or the Scottish fishing industry is entitled to somewhere between its population share and its industry share. So that would be between 10 and say 60% should be coming to Scotland. Now, how much it would cost is, is tricky. Again, you have to specify exactly what, what it is that we're trying to do, but the Scottish Creel Fishermen's Federation looked at the three mile limit on the West Coast mainland and we, we gauged that certainly the under 10 metre trawlers would need some sort of a subsidy, some sort of a compensation for not being able to fish within three miles of land. So say that was about £100,000 per boat. Considering there's 36 under 10 metre trawlers on the West Coast mainland, that would suggest a figure of about £3.6 million just to compensate the under 10 metre trawlers. It's arguable that the 10 to 12 metre trawler sector would need some sort of compensation as well, maybe decommission some of those vessels. It's hard to say. It depends exactly what, what sort of package we want to arrive at, but certainly somewhere between three and a half and 10 million pounds to reinstate the three mile limit on the West Coast mainland would be a, a, a reasonable sort of guesstimate. Thank you for that, Bally. Joe? Just to say a quick comment on not necessarily how much it cost, but maybe who should cover it and I think it's made, been made evident from the film and, and at the start that yeah our, our inshore waters and our seas haven't been managed properly and there's been decades of decline even though we've, we've had a Marine Scotland Act and we've got all these marine protected areas we still have declining fisheries declining habitat so I think it's about time you know that the Scottish government really invests in this in our seas and, and our fishermen and our communities and um, to help restore them so I think it should be on them. Thank you very much for that. Anybody else want to chip in? No. It was just, I, I would actually, it was just back to the first question, which is how much support we're from the industry is there. I mean, it's just, again, it's a sort of thermometer check, but uh, back in 2019, there was a, you know, a, a conference dedicated to uh, asking what measures are required for the scallop industry. Uh, so various stakeholders from the scallop industry met in London, as I understand it, for the whole UK fleet and 80% of the industry agreed that there was an urgent need for reform uh, of the way that inshore scallop dredging uh, is taking place. Thank you, Nick, for that. Um, the next question is, is there something I can do to help now while we wait for the government to take action? Anybody want to give us some hopeful news on action? Well, I say that you just have to start communicating with your MSPs because they're the ones that make the decisions. But I can see Cal waving her hand. She's probably got something to say. I was just going to say very similar. Contact your MSP, um, make your voice heard, use, you know, sign the petition. Um, this has got to come down to every person that, that has a voice about this, that has a, an opinion about this, making that opinion heard. Because we've seen time and time again that the government will only act when there's enough pressure on them from all sectors and um, and the general public and individuals. So um, yeah, I think the more individual voices there are um, demanding change, the, the sooner we're going to see that. Thanks very much, Cal. Um, Ali? Yes, I see the previous question there. How much, I'm um, sorry. If nothing is done, what do you think will happen to our seas? Um, I don't actually think it's about what will happen to our seas in the future. I think it's about the condition of our seas right now. And I don't think our seas are in a con an acceptable condition at the present time. Um, what will happen, it'll continue as it is now. We might lose a bit more as some fishermen become more desperate. But I'll be quite honest, since I've been you know, in the game in the mid-80s, you know, I think between then and now, they've pretty much covered every square inch that can be got at with fishing gear. So I don't know if it'll get much worse, but I don't accept the way it is now and I'd like to see it improve. Thank you very much for that. Has anyone got anything else? 
Dan? Yeah, I mean, this, this debate gets very polarised around fishing. Um, and actually, there are many more jobs and economic opportunity involved with the sea that tend to get neglected. And, and the things like diving, wildlife, sea safaris, bird watching, photography and recreational angling. And, and when I was a kid, I'm 55 years old, when I was a kid, I have photographs of me catching cod on the west coast of Scotland. Um, and it was possible then to go out with boats and rods and you go out to wrecks and you could go and co catch cod and haddock. Just about all of that has gone now. What we're restricted to now is, is based mainly sort of um, going out to look at seals and things like that, because most of that recreational angling has gone. And if you go to places like Norway, where there isn't scallop dredging close inshore, to places like Stavanger and Bergen, you can get onto a boat, hire a boat, go out with a rod, and within sight of the shore, you can catch large haddock, large cod, um, halibut, and things like that. And that's what it could be like in Scotland, but it isn't. So all these jobs are being denied to other people simply because we have scallop dredging and bottom trawling wrecking the inshore ecosystem, the fish nurseries and the fish, fish spawning grounds. Thank you very much for that, Dan. Um, has anyone else got something to say about that question? Okay, I'll move on to the next one. If we have a three mile limit, will that mean that there are no restrictions on dredging or trawling outside of the limit? Yes, Jenny? Um, I would say, no, it doesn't mean there would be blanket free for all trawling and dredging outside an inshore limit, and um, whether that's three miles or anything else, um, because all fishing activity has to have some sort of regulation to it, whether that's down to fishing quotas. But also, we have offshore marine protected areas that are in place, so that wouldn't see an end to those. They're there for a reason to protect special offshore deeper sea habitats and features that, that are fragile to the more unsustainable and destructive fishing methods that, you know, we were trying to look to exclude from the ins inshore waters. It's to protect our inshore habitats, but certainly there's areas offshore that, that need to be monitored and regulated as well. Thanks for that, Jenny. Anyone else? I guess yeah. I, would, I would just add to that that, um, as Dan's just said there, you know, this becomes quite polarised, and that is a shame. Uh, yes, there is a degree to which everyone here is in agreement that there is too much pressure on our inshore waters and that we need to do something about that. But there is always an industry that is potentially affected by the measures that we would need to take. So what do we do there? And, you know, other places are beginning to get their head around that in a much, much quicker and more effective way than Scotland, looking at identifying the areas where actually... Uh, some of these activities could take place. So, you know, and they're calling them go fish zones, you know, areas where actually parts of the industry, if it's going to continue in any shape or form and have the business confidence of uh, being able to fish there, but not in our coastal waters where everyone is beginning to recognise that they're absolutely vital for the, vit for the spawning and nursery grounds that fish rely upon. Yep, Dan. Can I just add to that, that this isn't just a naive fantasy of environmental NGOs. Where, um, uh, where bottom trawling and, and scallop dredging has stopped, for example, in Lamlash Bay at Arran, courtesy of Coast, we've seen a massive um, uh, ups, uh, upwelling of biodiversity. Um, um, the fish have returned, the lobsters have returned, the crabs have returned. And we know that when you stop doing it over a very short period of time, there is a huge uptick in biodiversity. And that's for the benefit of everybody, um, fishermen as well as every other marine industry that's associated with it. So it's not a fantasy land. Wherever there are no-take zones and proper marine, marine protected areas, uh, bio, biodiversity returns. And that's what we need to understand and encourage. Thank you very much, Dan. That kind of ties into the next question, which was how long would it take to start seeing the positive impact of bringing in a limit? I don't know if anyone wants, I'm going to ask Jenny anyway, because Aaron's got the only no-take zone. So if you've got something to say about that, that would be great. Ah, I can say something about that, sure. Um, yeah, so, so as, as Dan said, you know, we, we've seen the effects of what restrictive fishing can 
can have and the impact that has, a positive impact that has on biodiversity and um, ha habitat um, restoration um, and recovery. And in terms of timescales, I mean, how long is a piece of string? It, it can take years and years for ecosystems to recover and it especially depends what habitat at, at the bottom of that ecosystem has been damaged in the first place. If it's merl that's been destroyed, that grows less than one millimetre a year. So the big beds of it we have in Scottish inshore waters can be devastated in one pass of, of some fishing methods and that will take decades to recover. In terms of hard numbers, the Lamlash Bay no-take zone has been in place for about just over 12 years. Um, in a decade worth of research following that, we saw lobster numbers increase fourfold. Um, the legal size, landing size of lobsters, um, four times more of those compared to areas outside it. Um, and, you know, impressively, the marine protected area, which now encompasses our no-take zone, in just three and a half years, we've seen king scallops increase by six times the amount that there was compared to baseline studies before the marine protected area was brought in. And that's a different form of spatial management. That's not a complete no-go zone. So we have the hard facts there. It's done by independently reviewed science. Um, it's a published, there's published papers on that decade worth of work. So timescales, we're seeing results within a few years, but to get those real key habitats back that are really fragile it's going to take a lot longer. Thank you very much for that Jenny. Uh, Joe? Yeah I was just going to, to add to that and um, some of the work we've done as well around the UK um, and yeah marine life and habitats can recover quite quickly well in, in the grand scheme of things you know Lamash Bay and another place around the UK you see recovery of habitats within five years increasing as Jenny said crab and lobster and you can start if managed properly uh, within that area you can start to see benefits for for everyone fishermen inshore fishermen increasing catch but also as Dan mentioned recreational activities and and particularly to the local economy um, and livelihoods so yeah I think I mean we, the amazing thing about the sea is it, it can recover and it can recover back to its former self and can, can recover quite quickly um, but I think what we really need to do is, is act now in Scotland it's, it's declining declining if we're not careful we will be left with with nothing and you know that's to the detriment of everyone thanks very much for that joe and um, there's a question here that says there is so much information and awareness of issues like climate change and the future we're leaving for young people what can we do to get the young people more passionate and i i just think that they're not the problem <laughs> but i'm going to pass that over to the sea savers just like what keeps you going in the face of this grimness megan I think the most important thing in, to get young people into the sea is you've just got to take them there. Because um, once you're on the sea and in the sea, then you can't help but love it because it's so beautiful. And certainly my strongest childhood memories are all of beaches and swimming and sailing and and once you love it, then you're going to protect it. Thanks very much, Megan. I should say that Megan sailed further than most fishermen have in their lifetime <laughs> and to the most extreme ends of the of the earth. Poppy, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think this is really important as it is our future. I think that it's absolutely necessary that we all come together to find ways and solutions of making change that is beneficial to us in our future. But we also need to find methods that don't have a negative impact on our seas as it is so so important that we have a healthy and sustainable ocean i also think that working together is so much more effective as more voices can be heard and listened to and as megan said i also think it's vital that children are given the opportunity to engage with the water so they understand how beautiful it is and how important it is that we protect it thank you both very much for that thanks poppy um, there's a question here, it's all very well banning, trawling and dredging, but what about the other activities that damage habitats? Creeling has an impact too, will you be looking to manage creeling? Anybody? Ali? Yeah, I think uh, 
managing creeling is, is, is critical. Managing all, all fisheries methods is critical. Um, there's no such thing really as a, a sustainable fisheries method. Even angling, if done enough, can, can take more than it should. Um, so creel fishing, although it is benign, say, compared to dredging and trawling, it is, a, it is not 100% sustainable if, if left to its own devices. There's no guarantee that it's sustainable. So, you know, we would be looking through the Scottish Creel Fishermen's Federation for creel management that would be restricting the amount of creels that boats, individual boats can deploy and also restricting the amount of creels that can be deployed in a specific area. Now, these are quite hard things to do. The Scottish Government's never managed it yet. And um, we've proposed a pilot from our local association here, here in Sky and Lacalche, um, where we trial creel limits per boat and boat limits in the area. And it's a, it's a controversial pilot. The Scottish Government has refused it twice. It's been in court. We recently won a court case about whether or not the pilot should be considered properly again. Um, and uh, hopefully in time, we can write the prescription for how to manage a creel fishery sustainably. And that would be the model that we would hope we would roll out in the event of there being an inshore limit. Thanks very much for that, Joe. Yeah, just to, just to add to that, so we've done some work um, in, in the south of England um, looking at um, an area that has been closed off to dredging and trawling and looking at managing the activities within that. And it's something we're hoping to do in Scotland as well, because I think it is, it is, of course, the activities within that area, if they're not managed properly or effectively, then that can be detrimental or damaging to the environment. So, um, yeah, for sure that there are, certainly for, for potting, what we found in, in Line Bay is, is there's a level that is sustainable where that can coexist with um, conservation. So you can have levels of potting where the fishermen are fishing sort of less, less effort, catching, catching more and can demand and often get a higher price for that. At the same time, you can have recovering or restoration of marine habitats, an increase in species, and often you see an increase in commercially important species as well. Um, and you can have that coexisting with other users um, for the benefit of all. So yeah, they need to be managed, but it is possible. Um, and I think um, very doable. There's quite a few questions um, about the film saying that it was inspiring, but it's leaving people down or it's depressing and about the future. And is it too late to fix things? But I think from what Jenny and Joe have said about these various no take zones and things show that there is hope and we know what to do. We just have to lobby to get that done. Um, one of the other questions is the Scottish government say we have 37% protection from marine protected areas. The film says it's 5%. Um, I'd like to ask that one. So we've got 37% designation, but designation means nothing without protective measures in place. The actual area of seabed that is off limits legally to, to trawling and dredging is less than 5%. Has anyone else got anything to say about that? Valley? Come in this, please. Um, I'd just like to point out that you know, we've got 30 odd percent designated and mostly without management measures. But this is a huge issue about the enforcement of the existing management measures. For example, we've got a, a local scallop dredger here in Kyle, which practically every night of the week is in the marine protected area. And he's making an excellent living, which proves that the marine protected areas are working. He's getting more scallops than he ever did fishing anywhere outside the marine protected area. But without enforcement, you know, we're, we're kind of, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to get anywhere. So, you know, we need designation, we need management measures, but we, we really, really need enforcement because without enforcement, it's all meaningless. Thanks very much for that, Bali. Um, there's a few questions about why aren't the government doing anything um, worded in different ways? Um, what, what is the real political block to this, do you think? And why are the politicians not making the right choices? Um, Nick? I mean, in a way, it goes back to the same, to the question before, which is that I think a lot of people hear the sound bites that we are, you know, protecting 37% of our seas and people think, well, that's okay. That sounds good. Nothing to see here. Um, I'd just like to clarify that the 5% figure is actually just for the inshore zone. And, you know, I think the, the political, you know, MSPs, the people who are, engaged in this debate now in the Scottish Parliament are, are of an age that where they might not necessarily have been politically active at a time when the decision was originally taken to open up our inshore waters to bottom toed fishing. And so we haven't, there's a kind of disconnect between understanding the, the, the very real impact that that had 
in the eighties, and where we are right now is as as Alistair said earlier on, you know, we could carry on going on the way that we are. It just isn't a very good way that we're going on, and and it's become normalised. We've become used to this. Uh, so I guess there isn't a an awareness from the political class in Scotland that things could be different. Um, it, it's a it's a question of imagination as much as anything. Thank you, Nick. Um, Dan? Yeah, I was going to say, we also have suffered from, you know, what the environmentalists call shifting baseline syndrome. We're used to the fact now in this day and age that the that most whitefish stocks around the west coast of Scotland, for example, are now commercially extinct. And what we feed, what we catch is the bottom of the food chain. So it's sort of crustaceans and, and it's prawns. Uh, we forget the fact that 50, 60 years ago, the place was teeming with the fish. And 100 years ago, um, you, you know, people would talk about the, the shoals of herring that would come in that were, you know, miles wide and the and the sea would go oily and you'd get these great big feeding frenzies of gannets and orcas and dolphins. And it was a really very different place uh, to what it is now, which is completely denuded. But as everybody keeps saying, we can return to some form of biodiversity and better marine health if we stop ploughing up the seabed, which is the base level of the marine ecosystem. Thanks very much for that, Dan. Um, we've got loads of questions coming in um, about a huge variety of things. The consumer's role in this, educating people, green, blue carbon. But um, we're going to have to end. We could go all night, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you need your dinner. Um, so thank you all so much for participating in this and for sending in your questions and to you guys for answering them. If you've asked something and you haven't, been answered, please look at the FAQ on our website and um, we will keep adding to that. And if you can't find the answer there, email us at info at ourseas.scot. These are really bleak times for many of us just now, especially those of us that are homeschooling. But remember, there is hope. We know what needs doing for coastal regeneration. If you're in an organisation and you want to join us, please get in touch. Sign our petition, visit our website, harass your MSPs. Decisions will be made in Parliament in the coming months that are going to have a direct impact on the health of our coastal waters. If politicians think that people want to change, then they will act on it because that's their job. They won't change without action. As my old granny used to say, the squeaking wheel gets oiled first and she was right about a lot of things. So just keep annoying folk. Um, a huge thank to everybody that tuned in and to Professor Ian Stewart and to all the coalition members who work so very hard to make positive change for us all. So thank you all very much and night night. <laughs>